there's some really interesting things about the book of John. One, the author of this particular book, John, was a cousin of Jesus, and he was the brother of James, which was one of the other disciples. And the John who penned this particular gospel was one of the 12 disciples, but he was not John the Baptist. So just trying to clear up since we've got a few Johns in the Bible, so we know which one we're referring to here. And John the Baptist was also a cousin of Jesus. So just trying to bring that clarity. The John who wrote this gospel was John the Apostle, or even some would say John the Evangelist. He was part of the inner circle of Jesus, along with James and Peter, and those who were really particularly close to the Lord. In his effort to deflect attention from himself, by not actually giving his name, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved in this gospel. That's how he's referring to himself, and he calls himself that six times. Uh, and not only was John the closest to Jesus, he was also the last surviving apostle. And so he's writing this gospel as an 88-year-old man. And so just to give you a couple of tidbits that are on your screen from these scriptures, it says, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is talking about himself, following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper. So he laid back, he reclined back onto Jesus, and he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So that was from the last supper. And then in the chapter 13, 23, now there was leaning on Jesus's bosom. So he leaned back on him. Again, it's just the same reference and in a different place. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved. So you get the picture. He knew he was very close to Jesus. And no gospel tells us as much about the Holy Spirit as the gospel of John does. And in chapter one, John the Baptist testifies that Jesus received the Holy Spirit and that he'll baptize others in the Holy Spirit. In chapter three, Jesus is talking about the necessity of being born of water and the spirit before we can enter the kingdom. And in chapter four, Jesus speaks of the spirit as living water. And he says that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. In chapter seven, Jesus goes to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. And on the last day, the Jews would, they, they would enact this ceremony where the priests would fill up a water pitcher at the pool of Siloam and they'd carry it to the temple and then they'd pour the water out on the altar while they're praying for the autumn rains. And it was on that very occasion that Jesus stood up and he called out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. I will give him a spring of living water gushing up in, in his innermost being. And so the text tells us that he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, and it even says at this point, who would later be given to everyone believing in him. And then chapters 14 to 16, they're full of the new comforter, the Holy Spirit, who's going to come. So it's explaining the spirit of truth. And the Greek name for the Holy Spirit is paraclete. And so para meaning alongside and clete meaning called. So the one who stands by you or the one who is called alongside. The Holy Spirit is also described as one who's exactly the same as Jesus, that he'll continue to do the work of Jesus after Jesus has ascended, after he's left this physical earth for a short time, that he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment empowering believers and reminding them of everything Jesus said. I think that is eye-opening to me when I read that is the job of the Holy Spirit. It says, here's the things he's sent to do. He's sent to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, to reveal God's righteousness to people, and to remind them of the coming judgment. That should be like a wake-up call when we are in congregations that none of that is being talked about. If that's not in the message, is the message bathed in the spirit of God? That would be my question. So we see what his function is primarily in that description. And so in chapter 20, Jesus prepares his followers for the day of Pentecost by giving them a sign and a command. And the sign was blowing on each one of them. And the command was receive the Holy Spirit. But they didn't receive anything at that moment because this, what we're reading about here in John, it was a rehearsal for Pentecost that would actually occur a few weeks later. 
So that day, when they were seated in the temple, they heard the sound of the wind, reminding them of what Jesus had done in this gospel of John where we're reading it. Then they obeyed his command and they received the spirit as he had promised. John is it really a remarkable gospel. It's different from the other three. In the gospel of Mark, Mark wanted us to see Jesus as the son of man. So he was showing us the humanity uh, of Jesus predominantly. Matthew was showing us Jesus as the king of the Jews. So he was going back, even when he started that gospel, he starts out with the genealogy, wanting to show the Jewish history with Abraham, bringing us all the way to King David, and then showing us that he's in this lineage. And then Luke, he showed us the savior of the world. And so he took his family tree all the way back to Adam. He went back to the first man. And then John, here is this 88-year-old man who'd known Jesus for 60 years now, and he wanted to show Jesus as the son of God. And he must have thought to himself, where do I begin? And so he obviously said, I'm going back further than the other three, beyond Abraham and Adam, beyond the beginning of the Bible, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He went before anything existed, which is wonderful that we get the fullness of all of this in all four of the gospels. But this is the one that brings us all the way back to the start. And so he doesn't take us back beyond what we can imagine. He's just saying, go back to the beginning of the universe. Go back to the time when everything was created and God was already there. Jesus was already there. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The second thing that he stated in this verse is the personality of Jesus. He was with God and the word translated with literally means face to face with, talking with, looking at as two friends talk together. Jesus was face to face with God. He's a real person. And the third thing that this verse tells us is the deity of our Lord Jesus. He was God. There's no higher statement about Jesus in all the New Testament than what I just said, that he was God. It isn't saying that he was like God or was full of God. He is God. He is the same as God, exactly the same. So what you say about God, you say about Jesus. And the word was God. And so at this point, we need to look at the word, word. Why didn't John begin by saying, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God? The name Jesus was given to him first, only when he was born in Bethlehem. It wasn't the name that he had before he was actually born. It was his human name to describe what he came to earth to do. It didn't describe what he did before he was born on this earth. And the second reason is that John wants to give us a title that will describe exactly what he was before he came to earth. The Holy Spirit gave him this thought. I'm going to call him the word. John is the only man in the New Testament to call Jesus the word. So what does the word mean? Think about what words do for us. It's a connecting link between people. It's the pattern that we use with sound that expresses the thought of one person's mind and it enter, enters into another person's mind. It is words that provide a link between two people. A word expresses one person and enters another person. And it's this way that God and God's thoughts, which are so much higher than ours, were able to enter our minds. Jesus is the communicating link between God and people. God expresses himself in Jesus, and in Jesus, God enters people. He's the communication between God and people. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. God has spoken in Jesus, and through Jesus, God can enter our lives. And we see in verse 3 that Jesus was an agent in creation. God created everything, it says, through him. And nothing was created except through him. 
In verse 18, John sums it up by saying that Jesus has made God known to us. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Let's go over verse 35 in chapter 1 and look at the first two days in the life of the early church. John the Baptist had just baptized Jesus, and the next day he's standing by the Jordan River with two of the disciples, and Jesus walks by. And it says the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. As they followed Jesus, he opened the conversation asking a leading question. So they would have to describe their inner thoughts. He asked, what do you want? Not who do you want, but what do you want? He was asking them, why are you following me? Jesus looked around and he saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. So I want to ask you to ask yourself the same question. What do you want? Why do you come to Bible study? Why do you go to church? What's the desire of your heart as you come? Some people come because they're looking for comfort or for the answer to a question, but not many people come for some of the deepest, most meaningful reasons. It may even be just curiosity as it was for these two disciples. So Jesus asked them, what do you want? And they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? They asked him where he lived. Could you give us your address, please? They're saying, we're curious. We'd like to know where we can get in touch with you again. They were honest. Jesus didn't say, look, I came to take away sins, not to give people a house party or invite you to dinner. He said, all right, come and see. Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. He started right where they were and he said, come on, let's travel together. He didn't answer their question in so many words, but he was clearly saying by his response, I see that you want to know the person you want to know me rather than the place. So come home with me. Jesus was the kind of person who says, my home is open to you. I don't shut myself off in privacy. Come and see and share and get to know me. Spend the rest of the day with me. Turning to chapter two, on the third day of the early church, there was a wedding. So on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus rebuked her. Jesus said, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What was Mary really saying by telling Jesus that they'd have no wine? Jesus and his mother knew each other very well. And as Jesus looked into her eyes, he realized that she was saying more. He probably understood that what she really was saying was show your relatives who you really are. So in that, if that's the case, would be maybe a little bit of a mother's pride speaking. Do something miraculous. You've started your mission. You've been baptized. You've come preaching. Show your relatives first. You can tell what she's saying by Jesus's reply. She believed in him, but Jesus said, my hour has not yet come, which meant essentially he was saying, I'm taking my orders from a heavenly father, not an earthly mother. But then he did do something about the need in a way that the relatives were unaware that a miracle had even taken place. It all happened out of the pantry. So the relatives never even really knew that it happened. They were just enjoying the wine. It wasn't yet the moment for Jesus to display his heavenly power. And so he said, my time has not yet come. The inference of that exchange and the way that he handled it was like him saying, mom or dear woman, don't tell me what to do. My heavenly father is going to tell me the right moment to step into the stage. And even a mother's pride can't deflect me from the will of God. The fact that Jesus's first act in his public ministry was to attend a wedding shows what Jesus thinks of marriage as well. God made marriage and it's a high and holy estate. And he will attend a wedding that is done in his presence, where he's invited. Jesus honors marriage. So this story also tells us 
that Jesus rewards obedience. Mary said, one of those things that she said, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. The servants were going to have to give people water, and that would have been considered a great insult. And so I'd like someone to read, if you could, from John chapter 2, if someone has their Bible and can read verses 6 to 10. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars are filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, through, though a source, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the least expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. Amen. They did what he told them and he rewarded their obedience. Mary's words are still true. Do whatever he tells you. We also see in this story that Jesus stimulates our faith. The beginning of signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. He is always doing things to stretch our faith a little. The only limitation to God's miracles is our faith. But when you've seen one, you've really got a propensity to believe he could do it again. Our faith is strengthened. When you've seen two, you begin to even believe more. Your faith is stretched. He has an incredible way of growing our faith as we continue to walk by faith. But after the wedding, he went to a little town near the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum, but he didn't stay there very long. Uh, he went to Jerusalem for the Passover, and he saw money changers that were doing business in the temple. So he made a whip and he drove them out of the temple, turning the tables over. Tolerance is widely thought of as a Christian virtue, that we should live and let live, and that if we really love people, then we'll just let them do what they want, and we'll mind our own business. But here, Jesus is showing spiritual intolerance. He will not have certain things under the guise of religion. So let's look at the background. In Israel, more than two million people were migrating to one city. Every able-bodied male Jew would travel up to 100 miles, and they'd camp outside the city. And they, there were celebrations for seven to eight days. And so they were coming to say thank you for something that happened 1,400 years before. And we also need to thank God and celebrate that God began our salvation centuries ago. And that's what they were doing at this Passover festival. They needed two things when they went to the temple. They needed money and they needed an animal. The money was to pay the temple tax to keep the whole temple going, essentially. And you weren't allowed in unless you paid your half shekel. Then you needed an animal, but before you could offer them, the priests had to inspect the animals to be sure that they, that they were without spot or blemish. And often the inspectors would say, your lamb is no good. I've got a better one. Buy this one. And that's what was going on. The price of animals within the temple was up to 20 times as much as you would pay outside. And so the whole thing was just becoming a racket. And the religious leaders, the priests, the Sadducees, they loved money. They were behind the racket and you couldn't get near God without money. And Jesus came and this is what he saw. And so when something like this is going on in God's temple, Jesus blazes with fury and it's happening all over in our day. All his holiness is filled with indignation against things like this. And so can someone please read John chapter two, verses 13 to 17. Now the Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out with the out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Amen. And so the religious leaders, they came and they said, by what authority do you do this? 
if you went into a marketplace and you started turning over the tables and telling everybody to remove their merchandise, or even if you went into church and you started doing that, somebody's going to ask you, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? What do you have to do this? And he says, I am the temple of God. He's saying, I have the right to deal with this temple because I am the temple. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. They didn't understand what he said. That was the only sign he ever promised to give the Jews. They were always asking for miracles and signs. But Jesus replied, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That is the proof of the Son of God's authority to cleanse the temple. Jesus was saying, destroy this temple, but I will raise up a new dwelling place of God on earth. So do you see what he's saying? I have the right to deal with this temple because I am the temple. From now on, if you want to see God's glory, he's saying, come to me. If you want to pray to God, pray to me. So we no longer pray towards Jerusalem. We pray towards Jesus. He is the temple. He is given this us. He indwells us. And that's what creates the temple within us. A temple destroyed in three days, rebuilt. That is his authority for cleansing every human temple. On Ascension Day, Christians throughout the whole world remember that Jesus left this earth and the temple that was his body and was taken up into the high heavenly temple, where that heavenly temple stands now is a great high priest. And the New Testament makes it clear that God's temple on this earth is no longer in a building. You are the temple of God. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. The temple of our lives needs to be cleansed repeatedly, daily. Living in today's crazy world and this hectic pressures that we have with all the rushing around, television, social pressures, the news, the politics, everything shouting at us, so much that's in opposition to God's word. It's very easy for the father's house to revert to a busy marketplace. And sometimes Jesus will come to us and he'll say, this is my father's house. It's not a marketplace. Nothing in your life is to be common. Nothing in your life is supposed to be secular. Nothing. Nothing in your life is supposed to be the same as it is in the world outside. Everything is to be holy to the Lord. That's just what the word of God says. That might not be comfortable for a lot of people to hear. It truly is what he says, be holy, for I am holy. In chapter three, there was a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. His name was Nicodemus. And he came to Jesus in private, but secret, at night to ask him questions. And there's one thing that Jesus says that has puzzled a lot of people. He said, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What does he mean? Some people point to the fact that when a baby is born physically, the water breaks and the baby's born just soon after that. Of course, you have to be born physically before you can be born spiritually. You have to be born in the first place before you can go anywhere. So we should ask what would come into Nicodemus's mind when Jesus is mentioning water? Because the big talking point at that time was John the Baptist. And he was saying to all the Jews, you need a clean start. You need to repent of your sins, wash them away, and then start all over again. And there's someone coming after me who's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus would have surely thought of that. And every time water is mentioned in the first few chapters of John's gospel, it is referring to baptism. So Nicodemus, you need to be born of both water and the Spirit. You need to make a clean start to wash away the past, and you need the Spirit to create new life in you. Poor Nicodemus. With his brilliant mind, he says, I can't understand this. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Number one, to be filled with the spirit is to be born of the spirit. 
You'll never know what it is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit unless you've been born of the Holy Spirit. One of the categorical statements that's made by Jesus later in John's gospel is that the world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Cannot. That's categorical. If you're not a Christian, you cannot have the Holy Spirit. Second, we're told that unless you are born of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You're blind until you've been born of the Spirit. Nicodemus had realized that he taught, but nothing happened. But Jesus taught and signs come from God. And he's sitting here puzzled, like, how come? Here's a man who knows that theology is meant to work. He's a man who knows that the truth is meant to set people free. But nothing was seeming to happen with his ministry. And so you're, Jesus is saying, you're a teacher, or I'm sorry, Nicodemus says to Jesus, you're a teacher from God. So we know that he's acknowledging that he was of the Lord. And so Jesus was showing Nicodemus what was wrong. He says, let's go right back to the beginning. Until you're born again, you can't know this power. You can't see signs in your own ministry until you've got power. And it starts by being born of the spirit. Nicodemus wasn't trying to be awkward. I don't even think he was trying to even be just literal, but I'm sure he wondered how at this stage that he could go back and start all over again. How can you begin life again? And then Jesus said, do, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. He was saying, Nicodemus, you, do you feel that invisible power of the wind that's pushing on you? You feel that, right? That's how everyone born of the spirit feels. Just as one day you feel the wind pushing you, an invisible power pressing you, so that when you're born of the spirit, you feel the breath of God breathing inside of you, moving you. You can't explain where it came from or where it's going to lead you. Something is happening. And so it is with everyone who's born of the spirit. And there's a difference between a human baptism and a divine one, because one thing is quite clear in scripture, your preacher or pastor can baptize you in water, but can never baptize you in the Holy Spirit. There's only one divine person who can ever do that for you. One baptism does not supersede the other. For the entire history of the early church, both baptisms were sought, baptism in water, Baptism in the Holy Spirit. One was sought from another human being. The other was sought from a divine being. And both continued parallel so that when you study the letters that were being written to the early church, you find that they are equally described as being baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. All the early Christians knew both. And they realized that both were meant to continue together. Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He wants to pour his spirit in you. He wants you to receive and know you received because that's the ground of assurance. There are four fundamentals to evangelism. Repent to God for your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be baptized in water and receive the Holy Spirit. I don't really believe that someone's born again until we've led them through all those four steps. I also don't believe that someone can be spiritually born in five minutes because salvation is a process and it's not over in one day. Can somebody repent at the end of their life? Sure, absolutely, I believe that. But I'm just saying for those who are continuing on the journey, we're in a process of sanctification. But we can get people started in five minutes. So it's important that we explain these steps that begin with repentance. The work of the Spirit is an in, in an individual. It begins when the Holy Spirit convicts someone of sin and righteousness and God's judgment. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's job is that's what the scriptures told us and assurance in my new testament is based not on scripture but on the spirit the basis is i have received the holy spirit i know i belong to god because he has given me his spirit he is the confirmer if you bring people into membership who have not received the spirit then they are bound to have a problem you're not really evangelizing if you just get someone to decide for jesus it is Get your sins forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do you not know these things? Jesus is saying, you're the great teacher of Israel, telling people how to find God and you don't know this. Jesus continued, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? 
No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus knew his Bible, and Jesus knew that he knew the story of the bronze snake in Numbers chapter 21. The people had sinned against God, remember? Grumbling, saying to Moses, why did you bring us out here? Why did you put us in these circumstances? God punished them with a horrible death by a plague of snakes. And then they realized they'd sinned, and they said, God, why do we have to die? God had every right to say, look, I've done so much for you. I brought you out of slavery. I fed you every day. I've led you every step of your journey. Why should I even let you live? But God didn't say that. He said, I'll, I'll give you a way to be saved. He said, Moses, make a snake out of bronze and put it on a pole and stick it up on that hill outside the camp. And when anyone's bitten with a snake, just tell them to look at that snake up on the pole. And they did, and they were saved. And that was a type and a shadow of Jesus on the cross. When a person looks at Jesus, lifted up on the cross and believes in him as the son of God who paid the debt of sin. They're saved from the penalty of past sins. It enables a person to come to a realization of their need before they look. God doesn't just say, I'll take all the snakes away. He says, I'm going to leave the snakes there. So you realize the seriousness of what you've done, but there's a way out. And in the same way, God doesn't just forgive everybody and say, all right, everybody gets to come to heaven. I'm going to overlook all that you've done. He says, realize what you've done will lead you to die and then look at my son on the cross for you. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you need redemption. Nicodemus, you see me lifted up like that snake was on the pole and you look. Do you know what? Nicodemus did look. He looked and then he came for Jesus. He was actually the one who buried Jesus's body. So look into chapter five around verse 24. There's also a function we may have thought was just God's that Jesus is now claiming. He says, God isn't going to judge the world. He tells them, the father has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the son of man. Now, here's something very important. Jesus says, my father has chosen me to be the judge because I am the son of. Now, what would you expect to be said there? God he didn't say that. He said, because I am the son of man. And to be absolutely fair in his mercy and wisdom, God says, I want man to judge humanity. Someone who's shared human life, who's been tried and tempted, who's been through it all. And that is only fair because on the last day of judgment, people could say to God, you're judging us, but you don't know what it's like to be human and live in this world, to have these kind of pressures. But God will say, my son knows what it's like, and he's going to judge. The father has given judgment to the son because he is the son of man. Only one who is the son of God and the son of man can judge your life. I just think that's beautiful because it again shows us just how awesome God is in, in his character where he says, I'm not a man that I should lie. When he tells us that he is a just judge, we even see his justness, the links he goes for things to be so above board, he is beyond reproach in every way. Amen. In John chapter six, we read about one of Jesus's greatest miracles, feeding thousands with five loaves and two fishes. And so the day after the crowds, they kept on following him after he had fed everybody. And when they caught up to him, their first question was, when did you come here? When did you get here? The real answer was, if he was going to tell them what the real answer was, it was, I walked across the water, but Jesus didn't tell them that he heard the question on their lips, but he answered the question that he knew was on their mind, which was when's breakfast. And Jesus replied to them, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the son of man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. The Bible talks about those who have become gluttons, whose God is their stomachs. He's saying strongly, man shall not live on bread alone. Why do you work for food that goes rotten so quickly? You can't keep it. Make sure you obtain food that lasts forever. They answered, 
Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna. They journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them the bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. They said, give us that bread every day, but Jesus won't. He says, I am the bread. Come to me. In other words, I can't give it to you. You have to come and get it. Come to me. Then he talks about the result of coming. He said, if you'll come, you'll have infinite resources. Then he added something that upset them very much. He said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other and talking about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus again said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise that person at the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. I live because of the living father who sent me in the same way anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. The bread I'm going to give you is my flesh. That's what he said. Crude literalism is one of the enemies of the gospel. When Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus replied with crude literalism. How can a man get back inside his mother's womb? Crude literalism is actually a feature of those who refuse to think more deeply about what Jesus is saying. Jesus replied to those Jews adding, not only will you have to eat my flesh, you're also gonna need to drink my blood. He could have hardly said anything worse to a group of Jews. These are men who would use a, a kosher um, butcher to drain off all the blood from an animal because no blood should pass the lips of a Jew, even according to the law of God, right? But here Jesus said to Jews, drink blood. That was offensive. So notice something subtle. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. How can this be? How can that be done unless a life has been slaughtered? And this is what Jesus was saying to them. I've got to die to be slaughtered before you can eat because you can't have the blood without the flesh until death has taken place. And so the key word in all of this is life. I am the bread of life. If you continue to eat me, I will live in you and you will live in me. This is the living bread, the word of God that we are to continue to eat. At this point, many of his followers said, he's lost us. This sermon is too deep. It's too difficult to understand. We just can't even take it. That's the point when they should have tried to stretch their minds and maybe listen a little further. It's tragic when we only listen to, to sermons that are easy to understand. I'm thankful when I hear a sermon that makes me think. They didn't say this to Jesus, but he knew what they were thinking. He said, does this offend you? He was asking them if they found it difficult. And Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he says to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the son of man ascend to heaven again? The spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the father gives them to me. He says, if you find this difficult, what you're going, what are you going to think when you see me going back up to heaven? I know it may be difficult for you to understand my words, that there's spirit in life, but you have to grasp this if you're going to understand real life. You have to stay with me here. He's pleading with them to hold on. 
You need the father's help. That's why I said no one comes to me unless the father draws them. So for us, when you find a sermon difficult to understand, have you ever thought of saying, God, Jesus, would you give me a spirit to help me understand? Help me to understand what this word is saying. Help me to understand it by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give me revelation knowledge. Give me wisdom, which he promises to give liberally. Or do you just go home and say, I don't know what that meant. I'm just going to put that on the shelf. And maybe there's some things that have to stay on the shelf until the Lord gives us revelation. But do you ask? We come to the saddest sentence in John's gospel. At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? And I just think it's really interesting that this particular scripture, the vert, look at the scripture address, John 6, 6, 6. That's incredible. Anyway, confused heads invariably lead to wayward feet. So if you don't understand something, often your feet will begin to go in the wrong direction. And unfortunately, they turned away. Jesus was disappointed and he was discouraged. It's like he's looking at this little group that he has left and saying, are you going to leave too? Are you going deeper with me or have you gone far enough? This vast congregation of 10,000 had come back down to 12. Dear old Peter who often opened his mouth and put his foot in it, he said, we've got no alternative. Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus said, I, I chose the 12 of you, but one is a devil. At least it was sincere. He was saying, if we had an alternative, we might, but we've got nobody else to go to. It was honest. But in the nutshell, he was saying, you have the words of eternal life. Nobody else has this. Everyone else talks about this life and life comes to an end, but you talk about a life that goes on forever. Notice the order of his words. We believe and we know. In other words, we've trusted you first and afterwards we understood. In chapter 11, we read about the death and resurrection of Lazarus. It was the repercussions of this one miracle that led to the final plot to assassinate Jesus. And so Lazarus is mentioned throughout this passage. The council meets actually to plot Jesus's death and they discuss Lazarus. There's a supper at Bethany and crowds come to see Lazarus. The high priest decided to kill Lazarus too. Then we have this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It was Palm Sunday, but John tells us that the crowd was large because of Lazarus. Lazarus was the key figure in what happened the week before Jesus died. The high priest didn't believe in a resurrection, so it was a real embarrassment to them that Lazarus was walking around. Their theology and facts were not lining up, and so it was surely embarrassing to preach that there's no resurrection, but here's a man walking around who'd been dead for four days. They were blind that what they said, our views must be right no matter what happens, that what they said was the most important thing. They didn't care what the consequences were at that point. All the evidence was standing before us, but they were still saying, I, I don't want to believe it. Some believed and some didn't. It, it creates a tension and a fear of a rebellion among religious leaders. And so Caiaphas had come into his position as high priest through an agreement with the Romans that provided that there would be no civil disturbances and no underground movements in Judea. At the first sign of trouble, the nationality would be removed. And so the temple would be removed and Caiaphas would be removed. He had accepted the compromise for the sake of survival. And so Caiaphas, who was high priest at the time said, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it is better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He did not say this on his own as high priest at the time. He was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation. And not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. So he says, it's better that one man should shed his blood than all the people. And politically, he could have been right. But we know that Caiaphas was a scheming manipulator, a calculating politician who wasn't going to be troubled that the life of an innocent man was going to cost was the cost of maintaining the political peace in the country. But here's something wonderful. When Caiaphas said that God was speaking 
through him or when it's said of him, God, it shows us that God can speak through anyone. He can speak through a donkey. He can speak through someone who doesn't intend to be God's spokesman. Caiaphas was speaking purely as a politician, but God can use a politician's mouth, even if the politician doesn't realize it. He says, it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. And the Bible tells us that it is exactly what God was thinking at this moment. That's the meaning of Christ's death. And unfortunately, Caiaphas meant what he said purely as a political statement, which meant that they agreed on the sentence before the trial. It was really this gross miscarriage of justice. And so the whole council had already decided that this innocent man needed to be sacrificed to stop bloodshed in the nation. So it was only a matter of time until the mock trial was held and the unjust ver verdict was given. And in chapter 13, we read about one of the 12 apostles that lived with Jesus for three years. He'd gone preaching and teaching in Jesus's name. He'd healed people and even driven out demons in Jesus's name, but he'll never reach heaven. That's amazing for us to stop and think about. Jesus said, for the son of man must die as the scriptures declared long ago, but how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he'd never been born. This man gives a profound warning to all professing, professing Christians. You can actually get as near to Jesus as he was and end up lost. We need to ask why and look deeply into his heart because Judas wasn't some kind of ogre. He wasn't someone who was just evil from his mother's womb. He was an ordinary man that allowed the devil to get a hold of him. He was one of the 12 disciples who allowed Satan to suggest things to him. God knows the future as well as the past. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow, but his knowing doesn't make you do it. He holds us responsible for the choices that we've made and the habits that we form. God knew beforehand, beforehand what Judas would choose, and he was able to weave Judas into his plan. But how could Judas live with Jesus for three years and do what he did? It wasn't just one wrong decision. It was the climax of a series of wrong decisions. Judas had a weakness and it was greed. And he never dealt with that weakness or shared it with others. He was the treasurer for the whole group and he helped himself to the pot of money often. And a stage came where Jesus said, one of you is a devil, meaning one of you is against me. Later, it says that Satan put a thought into the heart of Judas. You could make a lot of money tonight if you betray him. And all the years of deception had opened his mind to a thought and the devil had already put it into his heart. Finally, when Jesus gave him the bread at the last supper, the fork, that the fork in the road, so to speak, it appeared. Jesus, Judas made the wrong decision. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. In John 15, Jesus paints the last picture in his teaching, a vine. In Israel, there are vines pretty much everywhere. They had already left the upper room and to walk from the upper room down to the Kidron Valley, they would have had to gone past the main gate into the temple. And on those gates were two large six foot long clusters of grapes that are were hanging from a vine. And they weren't real grapes. They were made of gold. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He was saying, I'm the one who's going to give God the grapes that he wants. Everyone else is a false vine. They failed to produce pr fruit, but I'm the real one. And it's in me that God, the gardener, will be able to pick the grapes that he's been looking for so long. Jesus used this picture and he said, I'm the real vine. If you want to give God fruit, you'll need to remain in me. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. A vine needs more attention than almost any plant. The gardener needs to have tools, a hoe and a knife, which he's constantly using to try to get the desired fruit. And who likes being cut down to size, right? Nobody. It's uncomfortable when God even cuts you down to size or cuts something out. And so there are two sorts of pruning because there are two sorts of branches in a vine. Some branches produce a lot of leaves, but never produce fruit. And so they have to be cut off the vine because they're useless. They draw from the plant, but they don't give anything back in return. So they're wasteful. They're not only use, not useful, but they're actually taking the sap from the vine. 
And so they're cut off, so nothing is wasted. That's one sort of branch. But we're mainly concerned with the other kind of branch. And it's those who produce fruit, but not very much. Those who have a little, a little sign that they're in Christ, but not too much. Those who do a little for God occasionally, what does God do to them? In his love and tenderness, the Bible tells us, he cuts them down or cuts them back. And so how does he do this? Jesus uses the same gardening word, prune. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Speaking to us through the words of Jesus is God's supreme method of cutting us down. His commands cut us down to size. Don't you think that that's true while we're reading this word? And sometimes it's just hard to hear because we don't measure up to it. And we still have, a, we need God's help to get us there. That's God's word cutting deep sharper than any two-edged sword, it finds you out. And that's how he prunes. It causes us to suffer, but those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He tells us that in Hebrews 12, verse four. Jesus said, not only do we need pruning, but we also need to remain in an active relationship with him. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. The only function of the branch and the vine is to connect the stem and the fruit. That's the purpose, and that's our purpose, simply to be the link between Christ and the fruit. The branch of a vine is barren by itself. And another aspect of the vine is that the branches are useless for any other purpose. They're wood, but if you want to use the wood for anything, you can't. It's too twisted and bendy to use it as a stake. It's got a lot of times thorns on it. It doesn't burn well. It's not sturdy enough to use it for furniture. The wood by itself is useless. But Jesus says, if you're really deeply attached to me and in continuous contact with me abiding, then you're useful. You'll do something with your life. The next text says that if a branch doesn't abide in Jesus, it's cut out and thrown out. It withers and it's burned. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. This is not referring to branches that have never been in the vine, meaning people that have never known Jesus as Lord and Savior. He's referring to those people who have been in the vine, but they did not stay in the vine. It's about them that Jesus speaks these solemn words. And it's a sobering reminder and motivation for staying in Christ. Held in his hand, from which no one and nothing can snatch you. But if we do keep the contact, what fruit are we producing? Fruit for God and fruit for people. First, the fruit of sanctification, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, and peace. Jesus said, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great joy, great glory to my father. Can someone read John chapter 15, verses 9 to 19? Brother Terrence, can you read? As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment. You love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruits and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world would love its own, Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Amen. Amen. So that is the conclusion 
of the summary that I wanted to bring this evening, but I wanted to close by giving a little summary about hearing the word. In Amos chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The problem isn't that God's word is not available. The problem is that God's word isn't being heard. The people had cut themselves off from hearing God's word. Hearing, they don't hear, scripture says. We've got to be sure that our ears are inclined to the word of God. He even tells us in the New Testament, be careful how you listen, because if you do not listen well, even what little bit you have will be taken from you. We've got to heed the word. There is hearing with the ears, and then there is hearing, which is heeding, with the heart and mind. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus says this more than 15 times, eight times in the Gospels and seven times in Revelations 2 and 3. Consider the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils. And there are some scriptures up there for you to reference in heeding the word as well. We've got to hold the word. So the last point will only be effective if we have already done the first two. When we come to hear and to heed, now we are ready to hold the word. The Bible often warns us about this need. Hold fast, hold on to. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things. Hold fast to what is good. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Hold forth, hold out. Philippians 2.16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain or offering the word, holding out to them the message of life. A couple of different translations of that same verse. And so here's the conclusion that Amos got it right. There is a famine in the land. And the good news is that we can help turn it from a famine to a feast. And that is in our own hearing of the word. So tonight you have heard the word now, will you heed it and will you hold it? And so I'm going to um, turn off my screen share and just invite anyone who would like to comment or to share anything that's on your heart or that the Holy Spirit has revealed or questions you may have. So please feel free to unmute. Love to just participate with all of you in conversation at this point. I just wanted to share one little thing that I got from the marriage that Jesus was a part of. Just one little slogan that uh, man will always keep the best for the greatest, while Jesus will keep the best for the least. Amen. Amen. I want to share. It's a wonderful teaching and it is the truth. And we need this. It's sad to say that uh, many churches, they separate the word of God and Jesus so what they do is that they feel that the word of God was written by man, apostles. And so what they do is that they look to the pastor and his word stays. And that's how you find many churches. I didn't want to mention, but I think you will know that the doctrine should be the word of God. But now the doctrine is separate and the word of God is separate. separate. And there is the famine of the word. And... We cannot blame anyone but ourselves. Jesus is always there. His word is always there. Thank you for the word. Amen. You, you brought up a scripture that I didn't share as well this evening that I think just confirms what you're reiterating in terms of the separation that sometimes the churches can have just in misunderstanding that he is the word, that this word, although it was inspired and it was men that wrote it, it says that these men that wrote it were compelled and moved by the Holy Spirit. And it was God himself doing it through them because he is the word. And so in Revelation 19, verse 12 and 13, it says he has a name written on him that no one knows, but he himself, he is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. So churches that struggle with the word have a serious problem. There's a serious disconnect there because he is the word. He's the word. Hallelujah. Yes, and even in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Uh, some may say, why was? Because then he eventually, in later, it says that he became flesh. The Word became flesh. 
So we cannot separate the word from Christ. Amen. And then that's one of the reason when we separate, then we wonder why there's no manifestation in our church, in our life, because. Again, I go back to even with Abraham, when it says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. What does it mean that Abraham believed God? He didn't just believe in God. He actually, it showed that he was justified, not just by what he that he believed it was actually that he did something because of what he believed so it proved that he actually believed but he acted upon god's word he believed god's word and that's what was accounted to him as righteousness this is the same faith that we are to have because that was the example to show us the kind of faith god was looking for the kind of faith that he accounted as righteousness which was to believe every word to believe god what he says, right? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? One thing that I've gotten through, um, through the, as you were um, teaching everything, God wants this relationship with us so deeply. And, and we, you know, and he wants us to come to him in spirit and in truth. He loves us. It's about relationship and how he wants it with us and how we are to not just come to him any kind of way, but come to him in a way that honors him grace um glorifies him and we love him just because he loved us so much it, it just is unexplainable how much he loved us that he was willing to send his only begotten son to bring us back into relationship with him i appreciate what you said as well about coming god's way again that's one of the purposes of the word is because it gives us the instructions that god has handed down to us to understand the way, which we know no man comes to the Father except through the Son, but he's given us the way to salvation, which is to repent, believe, and be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. It's the, That's the normal Christian birth, and it's laid out for us in the scriptures. And so there's many that just think they can come in a different way. And it's, again, it's a risk that does not seem to be worth taking to come any other way than the word has shown us. And if we're seeking him with our whole heart, we will find him. We'll find the right way. He will reveal himself. He says, knock and the door will be opened to you. He's so faithful to us. But I believe that's some, one of the benefits of being in the word is that we are not easily deceived and that we can navigate in a world that is full of a lot of noise because we have word hidden in your heart. Not only that, it's what keeps you from sinning. We know, again, it's the relationship is developing and deepening. We're in love with the Lord, this love walk, true relationship where we don't want to displease him just because we love him. He's so good and he's so good to us. Anyone else? Yes, please. You said something and I just really thank God because as I was thinking deeply, I remember a conversation that I had with my younger brother talking about his, I, the blockage there was him thinking that because God is all-knowing, he has already predetermined what we are going to do. And that was his confusion that we, were, we are going to do. So therefore, how can we, in the same breath, say that God is loving if he knows what we're going to do? And it, it seems that he has predestined some for destruction and some for redemption. And so... I remember that conversation was a very difficult one to have with him on that night. And it, 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 it at times got heated. And then I realized how my flesh was arising in that situation. But one thing that you said just clicked. It's that although God knows what you're going to do, he doesn't choose for you. You make the choice. But he can use you to still fulfill his purposes. And we really did see that with um, uh, Judas Iscariot. That right there says a lot. Because even though I tried my best to explain the, the, the principles of free will, and God never tampers with that. But God, knowing what you will freely choose, can use you for his purpose. And so that part of this lesson really stood out and really gave me another way to speak to my fellow brothers and sisters when this topic does come up. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Yes, I've had some of those conversations myself, Terrence, and I think that point is very important because it, it gives us the example that you're speaking of, whereas God, he has predestined some people, right? He has predestined, it talks about that in the scripture, and so it can be confusing, what does that mean? But I think that's the clarity because he's all knowing the beginning from the end, yes. what you're going to choose. So mm -hmm. knowing what you're going to choose, he'll fit you into his plan. It goes along with Romans 8, 28. God will work all things for good according to his purpose. So regardless of how things get off track, he'll still use this for the one he loves for their good, for his glory, as he promised. Do you know what I mean? But he'll use the others that he already knows the outcome on. When there's, when there's some for destruction that have to be placed into the midst of a situation. That's where we see in the scriptures as well, and the prophets speaking of how God's a potter and we're the clay. And who are you to question the potter? He says, can I not use some for my glory and some for destruction? He could do this. He's the creator. And he does. I don't believe he's doing that in a way that some might think, oh, that's just cruel because you're not even giving people a choice. Yeah. I believe wholeheartedly because he's a just God that he knowing the end from the beginning is just selecting the ones he already knows is, they're going to harden their own hearts. Now mm. he's going to use them for an object of destruction because they were already headed for destruction. So I believe because he's just and good and not a man that he should lie, that's what we can expect from him. And it makes a lot of sense with connecting that doctrine of predestination, because he's not playing a chess game here, he's he has given free will to us, which is a beautiful thing, because in that free will, that's what makes the love aspect so pure, mm -hmm. because he does not want robots that he has forced to love him. He wants us to, of our own free will, he wants us to choose him before we can see him, before we get to lay our eyes on him face to face. He wants us to choose him by faith. And it makes sense to me from what took place in heaven. If you think about the fact that the angels, there was this war in heaven that a third of the angels fell from heaven and that Satan, iniquity is found in his heart because he's the most beautiful anointed cherub angel who's one of the highest ranking in the heavenlies. And he thinks to himself, I'm going to be like God and I'm going to receive this kind of worship. And it grieved the Lord's heart the Bible says. And so that this happened. And so a third of his angels in creation, he has to cast out of heaven. And now it's been that he's got this plan for redemption. And it's really, it's the creation of man, but it's also the redemption of not only earth and not only humanity, but also heaven. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. And so it's like in God's plan here, he has separated his creation now for a time so that by faith, he can give them this path to walk. And if you think about that, it's a beautiful thing, truly, because it, you could see this masterful plan of how he's looking for the hearts that will be loyal to him before they yeah. even see him. And so I don't know. I, I just, again, that none of that I'm saying is none of that scripture, but it's all things that resonated in my heart with just the fascination of the storyline that we follow and how God is restoring all things in such a beautiful way. It's amazing. Anyone it's else? It's amazing. Phyllis, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add to that. In John 6, after he talked about, you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood, he says in verse 64, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who mm -hmm. would betray him. So it doesn't say that Jesus didn't allow them to believe. He said he knew who were not going to believe. And I, the verse that really just, it always resonates in my heart, but it did, especially tonight, when the Lord looked at the 12 and said, do you also want to go away? And Simon says, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. I love, I just love that. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are Christ, the son of the living God. That is just amazing scripture to me. And that's where my heart, I hang my hat right there. <laughs> and, amen. And thank you for bringing that scripture up because it confirms what we're talking about for sure. It's showing he does. He knows the beginning from the end and he knew it then. He knew who was going to betray him. Amazing. Amazing. Anyone else have comments or thoughts before we close out tonight? I have one uh, comment that goes along with that. And what I find even more amazing is we can go even further 
God was not caught unaware or in shock, even with Adam and Eve when they ate the fruit. He already knew that they were going to eat that fruit, even when, before he even spoke the words and told them, commanding them not to do it. But what I find about the compassion, the heart, and the love of God is that regardless of that, he made them anyway. And I always use the example, of maybe because I'm not as great a pet lover as some of you are, but I do know that if I did decide to go and buy a puppy and they told me at the store, this one is going to eat your shoes, bite your toes, and tear up your clothes, I would leave it at the store. But that is not the God that we serve. He does know, but he doesn't hold it against us. When God knew that he had chosen Solomon to be the king after David, he knew Solomon's end, but he did not hold it against Solomon. And he walked with Solomon every day till Solomon made the decisions that he made. Even God did not rebuke him and take him out of being king when the very first thing that he did was he married uh, Pharaoh's daughter. He came into covenant with the Egyptians, so he told them not to return back there. Don't even buy a horse from there. He didn't want them to buy a horse. He didn't want him to marry the Pharaoh's daughter. But I love that about God because he knows but he chooses not to, and he doesn't respond from the very beginning. He allows us to get to that place. And if we get to that place and we choose, God says how wicked Ahab is, but I'm moved by how when Ahab repented because Elijah came to tell him, look, your days are over. He repented and God goes and tells the prophet, do you see? Did you see that? Did you see that? I love it how he knows the end from the beginning, but he is a in this moment God. And he, and he converts and he is with us in this moment. Thanks. See, that's really deep what you're saying right now, too, because that is the complexity. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher. He's so much bigger than what we can comprehend, because like you said, he is an in the moment God, but yet he is outside of time, but he is an in the moment God. And that's the part where I think where we can get to a point in certain scriptures and we can know that the Bible says he knows the beginning from the end. We see the examples where it says he already knew certain things, but then we see a scripture like when he had Abraham bring his son up to test him and sacrifice his son Isaac, which of course he sends out the ram in his place and he doesn't have to sacrifice him. But he afterwards, when he stopped him, he said, now I know that you fear me. Now I know. You know, and it's like, we see that in a couple places in scripture and it's caused my heart to be like, wow. Cause I mean, I think of God, like he knows the beginning from the end, but then that's where I realized what you just said in the complexity of it. He is in the moment in those situations, but he's outside of time. It, and it's incredible. I see our brother Jed has his hand up there. So Jed, please chime in. Yeah. I lo love the conversation. And I just am thinking about another example of that with Jesus. I love the story of the Roman centurion who sends out a contingent to ask Jesus to heal his servant who he loves. And you don't even have to come to my house. All you need to do is release the word because I'm a man under authority. And it says that Jesus was amazed. In that moment, he turns to all of the disciples and says, man, I, have, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Like this moment of, can you surprise God? It seems amazed isn't necessarily surprised, but I just love that idea of the relational dynamics between God and humanity. Like in these moments, we can, our choices can make a really glad and happy God more glad. <laughs> he's mostly joyful for the, he's anointed with oil, the oil of joy more than all his brothers. And I just love that, that idea of what we're talking about where the Lord's, hey, did you see that? That, that blows my mind, or I'm so excited that she chose that, or she she's moving in that direction, and that we can really please the heart of our Heavenly Father. So, thanks. Amen. Amen. 
Okay, hallelujah. We're at the top of the hour. Sister Sylvia, would you pray for us as we close tonight? Amen. Father, we do so thank you. We thank you that you are the Lord our God. We thank you that you demonstrate over and again how amazing and how wonderful you are. That your heart's desire is to reveal yourself to us. And you do so through your word. We're reminded that in the beginning was the word and the word is God. The word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are forever faithful. You are forever true. And Lord, we thank you that your word does inspire. It challenges. It convicts. It conforms. It transforms your word because your word is spirit. It is life. And it is true. So we thank you on tonight for your living, breathing word. We thank you that you have breathed life on us again. And we thank you for allowing us to come commune with you and one another. And as we leave on this night, may we leave a change because we had another glimpse and another opportunity to encounter the God of the universe, the very lover of our soul. Father, I ask that you bless every single person and their families, those that are presented, that are here, and those for whatever reason could not be, because you are doing a dividing and a separation. And God, may we not be caught among those who your word is scarce or your word is not understood because we seek you out. And we are lovers of your word as you are lovers of our soul. May you cause us every day to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and mind, and to love one another as you have loved us. Thank you for this night. And we thank you for the rest of our week. Hold our hands through every storm, trial, tribulation. But God, also, even when we're on the mountaintop in your glory, may we never forget. And we never allow you to be far from us. You said if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. May we be true witnesses for you in this season, in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Shalom, shalom, everyone. We'll see you next Monday. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Yes, listen, I just want to say, love you, family. This is our spiritual family. Isn't this amazing? We're going to be in heaven one day being like, you remember those times we would sit on there Monday nights and talk about oh, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Bye-bye. <laughs> love, love you all. <laughs>